Good morning and welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you all here today. Um, we're going to kick off the webinar with Aaron Dolan. So thanks so much for being here, Aaron. Uh, my pleasure and uh, thank you all for joining us today. What we're hoping the session will accomplish is giving people an introduction to what it's like to publish in um, CBE Life Sciences Education or LSE for short. Um, and the way that this is going to operate, if you have participated in one of our other online with LSE webinar uh, events, is that we've typically used the Q&A function, but today we're going to use the chat function so that people can ask questions on the fly. So I'm going to type a little um, comment in the chat for all panelists and attendees. And, and what I hope is that you all can take a few minutes now to find the chat function. If you scroll over your window, you should be able to pull that up. Um, and there you go, we got some hellos, great. And you know, don't feel obligated to say hello, but if you'd like to, that'd be great. Um, this will be your, your place where you can ask um, questions and I'll do my best to sort of follow along on the chat and answer questions as we go. Okay. So now that people have found the chat button, button which is great, um, I want to give you sort of a general overview of what I'm going to do today. I'm going to walk through the process of what it's like to submit a manuscript to LSE, then walk through the, the editorial or sort of the review process, um, and then open it up generally for questions. And so you should feel free. I'm keeping an eye on the, the chat function as best as I can. Um, feel free to post questions as we go along. Okay, so say you're thinking about publishing an LSE. The first thing that um, I'd want you to think about is whether your manuscript is a fit for LSE in the first place. Um, and th the advice that I would have is, first of all, read papers published in the journal and see, does your paper seem similar? If it seems similar, then that might suggest it's a good fit for the journal. Check out what papers you're citing in your own paper. Think about um, what journals they're published in. If a number of the papers you are citing are also published in LSE, that suggests that it might, that your work might appeal to a similar audience. That's not to say you should only publish or only cite papers published in LSE. Um, and certainly I would actually discourage that. Um, but it gives you a sense of whether you're drawing from the same body of work, whether the kinds of things you're doing are gonna be relevant to that audience. Also think about what readers you want to reach. Um, one of the things I really love about LSE is that it's read by education interested biologists and also biology education researchers. So if you want to reach either of those audiences, I think it's a good journal to publish in. Um, but you also want to make sure that your paper is written in a way that would make sense um, and appeal to those readers. So you have to keep in mind that some of the folks who read LSE are, are people who want to put your research into practice. Um, so the work has to be presented in a way that appeals to them. And then there's some people who study biology teaching and learning, and you want to think about what are your implications of your work for those audiences as well. And then I would recommend consulting the about or the information for authors sections of the journal website. And I'm going to actually turn to those in just a second so you can see um, what those look like but I encourage you to pull that URL up and follow along as we go. Okay, so say based on that information, you figure that your manuscript is a good fit. So then what you wanna do is you actually wanna look at the guidelines for preparing a manuscript. Um, and those guidelines are presented in multiple places on the website, including the information for authors and also are the author's instructions on the submission site. Some um, little bits of information that might be helpful to consider. We get a lot of questions about whether there's a particular font or type size requirement, and there is not. And I really, really promise there is not. So um, I'm sorry if that makes you angry, <laughs> but you do not have to use a particular font or type size. Use whatever makes you comfortable and that you enjoy reading. Um, something that makes the review process easier and giving authors feedback easier is to use page numbers and continuous line numbers. Um, so I, we ask for all manuscripts to include both page, page and continuous line numbers to facilitate the process of giving feedback. And then when you're entering your manuscript on the LSE site, and I'm going to enter a fake manuscript to show you what this looks like, 
please use the home button rather than the back button. And that makes sure that everything that you're entering actually syncs with the manuscript site um, instead of the back button, which basically functions like a form and then your form gets emptied out and then you'll be frustrated because you haven't put your information in that you thought you did. All right, so let's walk through the submission process. And the way that I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna actually exit my full screen here. And I'm going to stop my share. And then I'm going to pull up the LSE site. And I'm going to pretend like I'm an author walking through this for the first time. All right, so I'm going to now share the LSE online submission system. Um, and this is at cellbiologyeducation.org. So the first thing I need to do is I need to log in or create a, a user account. And you'll see that I have some functions that are related to the editorial process that you won't have appear for you, but these are all of the author functions. So if you have manuscripts you've already um, got in review, or if you have manuscripts that are post-decision, you'll see that information here. But you can also see here that I have um, both the, a couple of pending or unknown title manuscripts, and hang on just a second, I want to make sure that I can see both the chat function. Oh, not the presentation view. Okay. Thanks for the information, Sean. I appreciate it. It's a little bit hard for me to track what I'm seeing, but hopefully right now folks are seeing the window. Okay. Can everyone see the window that I'm looking at now? Hopefully got some good views there. Um, and I appreciate you all bearing with me. The chat like goes on and off. There we go. Excellent. Thank you for the positive uh, responses. So these were the couple of manuscripts that I was fake submitting to myself as practice. <laughs> so now I'll submit a new one from scratch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit on the submit button. And you'll see that this is the information that I need to have ready to put in this submission. So I might spend a little bit of time just reading through this list and making sure that I have, for example, a title. Do I have all the author's names and contact information? Do I have my figures as separate files? All of that. And then I need to choose an appropriate manuscript type. And you can see there's lots of choices to make. Generally, two main kinds of manuscripts are submitted, and those are articles and essays. And I want to clarify a little bit about the difference between an article and an essay. So an article is any manuscript where you're gonna present your own data. So that can be data in the form of an evaluation study um, where you've maybe tried some new strategy, you're evaluating a program and you wanna show how well it works or for whom, that would be an article because you're saying this thing is, is a, a novel thing that I've done and I wanna present evidence that it works. Um, and so that would be an evaluation study published as an article. The other kinds of articles we published are applied or basic research related to biology teaching and learning. So maybe you have a fundamental question about how students think about um, DNA structure and function, and you've done research to try and reveal some of that student thinking. That would also be an article. An essay is a little different, and it's a little bit hard to say all the things that an essay could be. It's easier to say what an essay is not. So an essay is not um, a what works piece um, without evidence. And it's not sort of an article light. Um, it really can be a review, a synthetic piece, um, something that brings ideas together in a way that can inform people's thinking about biology education or biology teaching and learning. So I'm gonna pretend today that I'm submitting an article because that's the most common kind of submission we get. So I'm gonna select article and then I'm gonna hit continue. And you'll see I have lots of things that I get to enter here. The first thing you see is a place to drop your files. And I've actually made some fake manuscript files and also a fake cover letter. And those are the two things that I'm going to pretend to submit today. And I want to show you some examples of what you might include in a fake manuscript and what you might include um, in a fake cover letter. 
or a real cover letter, a real manuscript in your case. I see an author, a uh, question from the audience, can authors submit essays without being invited to do so? Absolutely, you can. Um, the invited features are typically the standing um, features in the journal. For example, Kimberly Tanner's approaches to teaching and learning, biology teaching and learning, that often has to be invited. Although if somebody wants to propose uh, an installment of that feature, that's, that's perfectly acceptable. We're happy to consider proposals. But essays are, all, are typically um, just submitted by authors who are interested in submitting. Good question. Okay. So let's first look at what a manuscript might include. And I'm gonna again share my screen and look at my fake manuscript. And you'll see, the first thing you see in the manuscript is oh, my lovely line numbers. And I've included my title and I've included um, the type of manuscript that I am submitting, just so that it's clear what I'm trying to submit. I've included a character count. Uh, sometimes folks are concerned about um, having too long or too short a manuscript. Uh, we're open to any length of manuscript, but generally what we find is that manuscripts that are under 80,000 characters are desirable. Sometimes qualitative work will be longer, but typically uh, manuscripts are shorter and folks just run out of steam reading much longer than that. So I'd recommend not going longer than that. There's gonna be a running title that's a shorter version of your title that, go, that is ultimately going on the top of the manuscript page when it is published. And then your authors are listed under that. One question we get asked a lot is about authorship order. Authorship order is really set by norms or practices in different disciplines. And because LSE publishes articles that come from education research backgrounds, anthropology backgrounds, Backgrounds, psychology backgrounds, LSE has no formal policy about what authorship order should be. That's really up to the authors to decide. And you could always disclose in the manuscript itself what each author contributed. And that's something that you actually have to do when you're submitting your manuscript. We ask for author contact information, and then we ask folks to identify a corresponding author. So one of the questions we get about corresponding authorship is whether there can be two corresponding authors or multiple corresponding authors. For the purposes of review, there can only be one corresponding author, and that's the person that is responsible for submitting the manuscript and for dealing with all responses to reviews or editors or anything about the logistics of the manuscript submission. If your paper is published and you would like to have two people indicated as a corresponding author, that would be the, this would be the place you would do it. You would do it on your corresponding, on your title page um, so that uh, ultimately readers can reach out to either of you or multiple authors if they would like more information about the work. Another feature of the title page is the keywords and you can include up to five as specific as possible. That helps people find your work and make sure that they're looking for work that's specifically related to what your interests are or what you've published about. And you'll see I've indicated ways that you can um, show whether you have co-authors that sh should be considered at the same level of contribution and who should be the corresponding author. So that's our title page. All LSE papers should include an abstract that's no more than 200 words. And then for an article, there's typically uh, standard sections you would find in any kind of research paper. There's an introduction section. And this is where you should focus on what this research about is about, what the manuscript aims to accomplish, explain why you did the research. This is a place to include your research questions, goals, or hypotheses and make it clear what gap in knowledge or practice that your work aims to address. Common issues we see in the introduction include things like not explaining any prior work that serves as context for the work that you've done. Um, a flag from an editorial perspective would be, for example, the inclusion of no citations of references. Um, or very few citations of references that suggest that you don't have a good sense of how your work fits into a broader body of work. 
And then also not making the purpose of the work or the manuscript clear. So sometimes we get um, papers that make mention of lots of different things related to biology teaching and learning, for example, problem-based learning, active learning, cognition, inquiry, lots of words that are used, but it's not clear which actually forms the focus of the manuscript. So I encourage you to stay focused on what specifically you'd like to communicate with the manuscript. The next section of a typical article is the methods. This is where you'd want to include information about IRB determination or whether the manuscript or the work has gone undergone IRB approval. And I see there's a question from the audience. Um, let me finish the sentence about IRB determination. So it's a lot of work published in LSE is actually considered exempt from IRB review. But that cannot be determined by the authors themselves. It has to be determined by a qualified person or re review board. And this is where that kind of information should be included. Um, if the study undergoes IRB approval, that's where that information should be included as well. So I see a uh, question from the audience. Um, is it acceptable to indicate two authors as having contributed equally? Absolutely. And that's where, let me scroll back up and I hope I'm not making anyone seasick. For example, co-second authors are listed in alphabetical order, even though they made equal contributions. Um, and you could have two first authors that are equally contributing, two second authors that are e equally contributing. Um, you can make whatever note of that you'd like on your title page. Okay, and now I'm going to go back to our methods. In the methods, you can include any subheadings you would like. Oh, do essays need to have an IRB too? Typically, they do not. Um, they, anytime you're involving collection and presentation of human subjects data, you need to have an IRB either determine exemption or review the work. So typically, essays don't present a lot of primary data. Um, but if they do, then yes, absolutely. They would need to have either a determination of exemption or a review. OK. So subheadings and the methods. Um, you can have whatever subheadings you'd like, but common subheadings that help people make sure that they have the information that they need to present are study design, where you explain the overall um, plan for how the research was carried out, context and participants, so who actually participated in the research, how they were selected, how they were recruited, what context the research took place in, one institution, multiple institutions, those kinds of things how the data were collected, including any ways that data were collected, any tools for data collection, and then data analysis. And so anything that was involved, any decisions made, um, justifications for those decisions. And I'll explain a few common pitfalls. So common issues that we see in the methods are not citing sources. Um, and of course, sometimes you have to develop your own methods in doing research. But there are established methods for carrying out a lot of this work that gets published in LSE. So I'd recommend citing sources and using those sources as um, evidence for particular uh, methodological decisions or study design decisions. Another issue we see is not including enough detail about how data were collected or analyzed, um, especially any decisions or rationales for those decisions. For example, say you decided to use one way of measuring scientific identity versus another way of measuring scientific identity. Why did you choose your way? Or say you wanted to measure student learning using a particular test. Why did you choose that test and not any other available test? Another issue we see is that people don't include their data collection instruments. And by this, I mean anything you're using to collect data from people. That can be tests, that can be assignments, that can be interview protocols, that can be surveys. Um, anything uh, that you use to collect data should either be included, um, and they can be included right in the methods, or they can be included as supplemental materials, or the um, material should be cited. So for example, if you're using a published survey instrument, there should be a citation where both reviewers and readers can find information about that survey. Um, about supplemental material. So if the methods are really detailed or tangential to the main point of the manuscript, you can include those as supplemental files. 
Supplemental files are materials that get published along with your paper, but aren't edited and aren't proofread in the same way that your manuscript file is. Um, it, it's a great place to include um, any kind of uh, assessment tools, any kind of data collection tools, even um, R code you've used in analyzing your data, anything you think would be helpful for understanding your work or replicating your work. Files for review only are also an option. Say, for example, you use a test to measure student learning, and you would like to keep that test confidential so that you can continue to use it to measure student learning and you don't have to worry about it getting out on the web. There's an option to include files for review only, um, and those will be available to reviewers and to editors, but not ultimately published with the journal, with the manuscript. Um, what we would ask is that you're willing to share these files if readers are interested and you can include a note in your methods that people who are interested can reach out to you um, to get that information if they need to in the future. Uh, LSE tries to emphasize open access as much as possible, but we understand that people want to maintain the integrity of some of their assessment tools and therefore not share them publicly. The next section of a paper, typically an article paper, is the results. And this is where um, you start by providing an overview of the results to help the reader know what is coming, but then you use subheadings to help them navigate um, your results. So you can again use any subheadings you'd like. Uh, meaningful subheadings are typically more interesting and usually make more sense than operational subheadings. And by this I mean use a short phrase that reflects the main finding. Don't just say, these are the qualitative results and these are the quantitative results. Um, help the reader make sense of what they're, they're about to see and use your heading strategically that way. Limitations. So every study has limitations and that is okay. This might be a place to point them out. You can point them out after your results, you can point them out before your results, you can point them out in your discussion but please point them out somewhere in the manuscript. It doesn't matter where. Consider explaining how you tried to address the limitations and make suggestions. Nobody knows your work better than you. So you are really well positioned to suggest how limitations might affect the interpretation of the results and also to make suggestions of ways of addressing those limitations in future work. It is okay to have limitations and it's much better with you as the informed person about your work recognizing and giving advice about those limitations than just to pretend that they didn't happen. The discussion. Okay, this is the place where you want to not just summarize your results, but focus on discussing what the results mean. And this is again where I think LSE is pretty unique. You can talk about what your results mean for practitioners, those education interested biologists you're trying to reach, and researchers in the form of education, re education researchers, both within and beyond biology. So some things to think about are what can practitioners do right now based on the work you've done? What should they think about doing or, or what should they be thinking about for the future? And the same for researchers. Some folks may feel uncomfortable um, talking about practice when their work is very focused on, on basic understanding and, and that makes sense. You can be cautious in making recommendations for practice, but at least think about what practitioners should learn because practitioners make up a good body of our readership. And I think that's an important, important uh, part of our readership. Okay. Um, acknowledgements are a place where you should include any recognition of funding sources. And as much as I appreciate authors acknowledging editors, that's our job. This is our job is to do the editorial work. So no need to acknowledge editors. And then finally, references. Um, please include those in APA format. We've included examples on the information for authors page. Um, and please alphabetize rather than number them. This makes it easier for reviewers to look at um, who you've cited and to understand how to bet make sense of your work in context. Okay. Figures and tables are of course an important way to present results. All figures and tables should be numbered, they should have titles, they should have legends. Okay, questions, yes. Questions about what parts make up a manuscript.
Okay, I'm not seeing any questions right now, but feel free to continue um, typing if you want. I'm gonna go ahead and share. Um, my fake cover letter. Okay, so what you might put in a cover letter. Ooh, I see a question, thank you. Can, uh, so all figures and tables are uploaded in the same file as the article text, one giant article. So typically, um, what we ask is that figures and tables are uploaded separately in separate files and that the figure and table legends are uploaded as part of the article at the end of the article after the references. Um, sometimes it's easier for reviewers if you put it all in one doc file, but then we'll eventually need those separate files of the tables and figures. And I know it sounds scary as one giant article, but people do it all the time and it works out okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so the one question from the audience is how has LSE, uh, what is LSE's view about publishing K-12 related work? Absolutely. We just tend not to get it submitted. So we can only publish what we receive. Um, but we're interested in biology teaching and learning across the spectrum. So it can be informal education, it can be K-12 education, it'd be higher, educa higher education, any level is fine. Okay, one of the submission types was research methods. Um, so that's a good question, whether that refers to the development of instruments such as surveys and protocols. So typically development of instruments such as surveys and protocols would be considered an article because you're presenting both the development and validation of the instrument or the measure. Um, research methods is more like a how-to guide. For example, how to carry out structural equation modeling, how to conduct Roche analysis, how to make use of a theoretical framework. Um, so those are more practical pieces that help people carry out methods. And you can go to the LSE main site and search under collections for research methods to get an example of what, a sense of what that's about. And then can you submit a paper without being affiliated with a university? Absolutely. So you just have to include your contact information. Um, if you did the research while you were affiliated with the organization, then you might still want to include that affiliation. Um, but that's really up to you and the, the organization that you're affiliated with. Good questions. All right, let's take a look at... Um, okay, I see a question on the Q&A, and I'm doing my best to watch between the chat and the Q&A. If folks can use the chat, that's a little bit help, more helpful because I can look at it continuously. Um, do people pre-print their LSE manuscripts? And yes, they do. So um, BioArchive is one place that LSE authors uh, submit their preprints. Psych Archive is another place that people um, post their preprints. Um, and let me just clarify what LSE's policy is regarding preprints. And I can turn off my share for a minute while we do that. Um, so preprints are articles or manuscripts, I should say, that haven't undergone any peer review. And so LSC's policy is that you can make your preprints available on a preprint server or on your website um, as long as they haven't undergone review at all. Once they've undergone review, um, if you're considering continuing to publish them in LSE, we ask that you not update the preprint with revised versions. You wait until the final version is completed and then you can present that with the appropriate citation of the LSE paper. And the idea there is that reviewers and editors put a lot of work into giving feedback on manuscripts. And so we want to sort of make sure that that work gets recognized by putting your paper in the journal. So if you want to make your preprint available before you benefit from that review process, great. Once you benefited from the review process, we, we ask that you wait until the final version is live, and then you can update that version that's elsewhere, posted elsewhere with the appropriate citation. Okay. I'm going to go back to sharing my fake cover letter, and then we'll walk through the rest of the submission process. Okay. So date, greeting, title of your paper, a brief description of why you think your, your paper is a good fit. 
A couple of things that you might consider doing is you might consider requesting a specific editor. If you know an editor has expertise in your area of interest, then feel free to ask them uh, or ask us to invite that editor to be the monitor for your manuscript. Similarly, please suggest reviewers that you would think would be a good fit with reviewing your manuscript. Um, one thing that uh, I would encourage you uh, when you're suggesting reviewers to consider is you shouldn't have people who potentially could be in conflict. For example, people at your same institution, people who have been co-authors with you recently, those would all be considered conflicts of interest and those should not be suggested reviewers. The final thing we ask folks to do, authors to do in their cover letters is to indicate that they're not submitting the paper anywhere else. So it's solely for cons uh, consideration for publication in LSE and that all authors have reviewed and approved the manuscript. So that gives you some sense of what kind of information needs to be included in a cover letter. All right, so now I'm gonna continue walking through my fake submission by sharing my site here. So I've got my fake cover letter and my fake manuscript and I'm gonna upload them here. I've just dropped them into the drop files and I'm gonna hit the upload files like this. And when I've done that, I can then choose what information each file represents. For example, my cover letter here is my author cover letter. My fake manuscript is my article file. Say I had some tables or, or figures or supplemental files, I could also upload them here. And if I want to move them around, say I upload my fake cover letter second, I can actually just drag and drop using that move function and reorder them however makes sense um, for me that I'd like to present the work. Oh, so there's a question from the audience about whether it's okay to mention editors who might be in conflict. And absolutely, that's the case. I'll show you where you can do that um, when we get to the rest of the submission page. Okay, so I've got my two files there. Now I'm going to just walk my way through this menu. Go to the title. And this is where you basically copy and paste parts of your manuscript into the corresponding pieces of the entry. So I can enter my awesome manuscript title here. Net running title here. And you'll have to excuse the typos. I'm gonna have my abstract here. The highlight summary for the table of contents is a little short description that gets published along with um, your manuscript. So it's just a little taste of what your manuscript is about. And this is kind of a nice thing that we can use, for example, when we're tweeting about your work or that helps authors, or sorry, readers get a quick sense of what your work is about. So I'm going to write highlight and then I'm going to hit next. This is where I'm going to enter my authors and I'm going to choose both who is going to be an author and authorship order. So say I'm going to add, I'm going to pick on my a postdoc in my group, Lisa LaMary. So I'm going to enter her name and I'm going to see, does she already have an account? And it turns out she does. So I can just select her and say she is going to be the first author for this paper. I'm going to change her to author one. Ooh, hang on a second. I'm going to do another part first. She's the one that conceived and designed the experiments, and I'm the one that maybe helped draft the article along with her helping draft the article. Then I'm gonna hit save. And you'll see that this actually collapses when you hit save so that you see just the author's name. And this will allow you to then change your author order. So do you see how I just dragged and dropped and moved my authors around? So this makes it super easy to order your authors after you have selected which authors. If the authors are already in the database, you cannot change any information about them. 
but you can have contact us and we can update their information or you can have the author update their information themselves. Also, you can enter new authors by entering information about them required here. Okay, I'm gonna continue on to my next page. These are places where you reassure us that you have uh, conducted your work ethically, for example, by making sure that you're aware of our policy on research misconduct, that you don't have a duality of interest, or if you have a duality of interest, for example, you're going to make money from the thing that you wrote about, that you've disclosed that. We make sure that you have not published the materials anywhere else. And that your work, if it includes human subjects data, actually has been reviewed or determined to be exempt by an institutional review board. We also wanna make sure you've included the instruments used for data collection. So this would be a place where you can comment on that. And you might include, uh, the last question from the audience was about whether editors are potentially in conflict. So you can include that in a manuscript comment there um, or anything else you would think would be helpful for understanding the editorial review process would be helpful to include there. This is where we ask folks to either commit to paying the article fee that we charge for article and essay publications, or to indicate that they're going to request a waiver. And waivers are available for folks who um, don't otherwise have access to funds to pay for their work. Financial disclosure is recognizing any potential source of funding for the work. So that allows us again to check that you've disclosed any potential uh, financial support or financial benefit. This is the place where you can indicate under suggestions, either preferred monitoring editors or not preferred monitoring editors for people you don't, you for example, don't want to serve as monitors. Um, we have a question from the audience about what the publication fee is, the article fee. The article fee is $1,900 which is on par with other open access journals. Um, and that's the amount we need basically to recover the costs associated with the whole process of publishing and review. Under suggestions, you can also suggest reviewers to include or exclude. Again, this is super helpful for understanding um, who might be giving a useful perspective on your work, it also helps um, editors identify new people who might be interested in learning about the journal. We have a question from the audience about whether you, what if you publish the instrument elsewhere? Um, so this is a good question. If it's published and publicly available, you can cite it. Um, if it's published in an open access journal, for example, um, LSE is published under a Creative Commons license, which actually allows you to maintain the copyright and republish the same item, for example, a figure or a survey instrument, as long as you cite the paper. So that, that allows you to include it locally in the manuscript that you're presenting or submitting for um, peer review so that reviewers and authors, I mean, sorry, readers can see the instrument right there while they're interpreting your data. So that can be super helpful is to have it there. But if, you, um, if that's not the case, if, for example, it's something that is not publicly available, um, then I would recommend including it as file for review only. Um, do you need to have proof that you qualify for a waiver? So the proof that we ask for if is, first of all, wait until we have a favorable decision on your manuscript, because we don't want you to go through the work of um, providing that evidence um, until we're at that stage. But then the proof that we ask for is that you have an administrator at your institution, um, either a department head or a dean, explain that this work is actually unfunded and that there are not funds available. Typically, um, folks who are at institutions that have limited research infrastructure get a full waiver if, they, if the work qualifies. Um, and folks who are well-resourced institutions get a partial waiver. Um, 
So that's typically the decision. This is actually handled separately from the review process because we want to make sure that the review is completely separated from any decisions about funding. So decisions about fee waivers is handled by ASCB, which is the professional society that publishes the journal. Okay. So say I don't wanna suggest any editors or reviewers, I can proceed and then, oh, look, see, anything that's in red is something that I need to fix. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that all the authors have read and know of this submission and approved it. Okay, so I need to write something in here. Do you see how I'm, all the red points tell where the errors might be? So we use that as a signal that everything is ready to finalize or not. There's a question, does the publication of fee apply to all types of manuscripts? No, it only applies to essays and articles. And I'm gonna to continue to walk through this. It looks like everything is set to go. Do you see these red arrows? These are places where I have to look and make sure that my PDF has converted okay. Look, it looks good, so I'm gonna approve. And again, my cover letter looks good. So I'm gonna approve, or I can edit and replace. And then it is submitted. So now I have a new live manuscript. So that is the submission process. Now let's talk about what then what happens. <laughs> and I'm gonna use this off of presentation mode to make my life a little bit easier and be able to chat, check the chat. So what happens next is there's an initial quality check by the journal manager. So we look for things like there's actually a cover letter, there are page numbers and continuous line numbers, that all the pieces uh, should be submitted um, in a way that fits the operations of the journal. Once that's done, what file format and figures should the figures and tables be submitted in? I would recommend looking at the information for authors because those details are submitted there. Typically tables are included in Word format at the end of the manuscript and then figures uh, need to be submitted and there's a couple of different options for how they can be submitted on the information for authors. Good question. Okay, so once that quality check is done, then I do an initial editorial review. And this is where I look for um, a couple of different things that I'll talk about in a minute. Basically, this is where we make a decision about whether to send a paper out for review. If we decide to send a paper out for review, um, a monitoring editor is assigned, and then that person decides um, who should serve as reviewers and invites reviewers who are given about two weeks, but obviously life happens and we understand that reviewers sometimes need more, more time. So they may have up to four weeks to submit their review. Then the reviews come back to the monitoring editor. The monitoring editor reads the reviews in the manuscript and renders a decision. The options for decisions are accept with no revisions, revise only, revise and re-review or rejection. Once the monitoring editor has written their decision and rendered a decision, then the letter comes back to me. I read the decision and reviews before they're sent back out to the authors. Um, and then let me talk a little bit about accept what, what, what these different decisions mean. So accept with no revisions is exactly that. It goes straight on to publication. Revise only typically means that there's some revisions needed, but the resubmission will be reviewed only at the editorial level. So it doesn't need to go back out to reviewers. Re revise and re-review means it will go back out to reviewers for additional input. And then a rejection means that the, pa the paper is not suitable for publication in LSE. And so it should not be revised and resubmitted. So why do papers get rejected? Here are some of the main reasons. 
One is that the work doesn't contribute to knowledge or practice. So it addresses something that we already know, for example, that active learning works. Another main reason is that the goal of the work or the manuscript is not a clear. Again, many ideas are mentioned, but none sort of form the focus or the basis of the work or the manuscript. A third is that there's no reference to related work as context for the current work. So this makes it really hard to figure out what the contribution is. Um, so that's a, a reason why uh, work gets rejected. The, if the methods are particularly limited, especially related to measurement, um, so say, for example, a manuscript is submitted and the authors make claims about learning, but the only way they measure learning is by asking students whether they learned. This would be called an indirect measure, and, and that's concerning because you may think you've learned something but not actually have learned it, or you may think you haven't learned something but you did learn it. And so what we suggest uh, authors do is they try to measure the thing they're interested in as directly as possible and using established ways of measuring the thing that they're interested in. And when, when I say established, I usually mean published, vetted ways. Um, if folks are familiar with the terms valid and reliable, those are the kinds of things we wanna be looking at. Sometimes folks wanna develop their own measures. For example, they don't wanna develop their own test or their own survey. There has to be a really strong argument for doing that and some evidence to suggest that that was a good way to go methodologically. Another uh, reason that work gets rejected is because the claims are not well supported by the data. So people overclaim um, based on the evidence they've actually presented. So what I'm gonna do at this point is stop with my comments and encourage you to please use the chat to ask whatever questions you would find helpful. And I'll do my best to answer in the remaining time that we have. So one question is, can we elaborate on the limitations related to measures? So um, sort of, <laughs> um, let me give you an extreme example. So say someone wants to see whether a particular experience improves student's scientific identity or influences student's scientific identity. There are established ways of measuring science identity um, and there's different ways of doing that but there are several ways that have been used pretty consistently um, by people doing work in the field. Um, and so it's best to use one of those ways rather than to develop your own way. Um, and that's for two reasons. First of all, there's actually a lot of work that goes into determining whether a survey is a good way of measuring, for example, science identity. Um, so if you can take advantage of that work and build on it, awesome. Then you can feel more confident in your results. Also, if you used an established way that's been used by other folks, you can compare your results to results from other folks. And so that actually allows for replication and comparison across papers rather than having each paper be its own idiosyncratic approach to trying to measure particular variables of interest. So hopefully that helps a, li a little bit. There's a question about could one submit a white paper to seek advice if planned, uh, oh, to to see whether a work might be a fit with LSE. Absolutely. So I probably wouldn't go as far as a white paper, but maybe um, uh, an abstract or a brief summary about whether something is suitable. What we don't wanna do is do a review outside of the review process. So sending a whole manuscript and saying, is this publishable wouldn't be appropriate, but sending a paragraph and saying, does this seem like a good fit with LSE is absolutely appropriate. There's a question about the acceptance rejection rate. Um, so I think the acceptance rate overall for all manuscripts is, is between 30 and 40 percent. So imagine that it's um, 33 percent. We'll just say it's about there, between 30 and 40 percent depending on the year. Probably about a third of manuscripts are rejected editorially. So for one of those reasons that I called out. Um, and then the rest, the other 65 percent, go out for review. And of those, about half are rejected after review, 
and then the other half are ultimately accepted. So that should give you sort of a sense of where, where things are with rejection and acceptance. Um, so there's a question about context of studies and where are good resources for overviews on educational theories in higher education, like expectancy value theory. So there are so many good reviews out there. That's a great question. Um, what I might recommend doing is if you feel like you're wading into that a little, little bit, but you don't feel super confident, is try and find someone who's done work in the field. Um, maybe look either for an, uh, someone who's published in LSE um, and either reach out to them for suggestions, or you could look at who they have cited and then look at that work. So one of the things I do a lot is actually look on Google Scholar and look at who is being cited repeatedly by people who are doing cutting edge work in the field. And I use that to find reviews or essays that help me get up to speed on an educational theory that I might not be familiar with. Uh, there's a question about whether this webinar is being recorded. I believe it is. I see the little recording button. So this will be available to people so that you can share it with colleagues and also so folks who missed it can, can see it. There's a question about recommendations for a clearinghouse for well-established surveys. So um, if folks know of clearinghouses, please uh, post them in the chat and we will make them available. My experience is that I mostly just use Google Scholar and I search for measure and then the thing I'm interested in, for example, measure scientific identity. Um, and, and then go and find what is it that people are using and what's been used recently and what are people's reasons for using that particular way? I might even reach out to the authors. You know, the worst thing they can do is ignore you, um, but at least you've given it a shot. Um, there are uh, clearinghouses. Um, I'm blanking on examples right off the top of my head. There's a, like a psych measurement clearinghouse, um, but a lot of those measurements are not open access or publicly available. You have to pay for them. And usually if work is published in open access journals, you can get access that way or by reaching directly out to the authors. Someone asked a question about preprints. So preprints are basically manuscripts that have not been reviewed or published. So say you have a manuscript and you're about ready to submit it to a journal, that would be a preprint. So that's the kind of thing that you can include in a preprint server like BioArchive or PsychArchive. And if folks are not familiar with what that is, I'm gonna write, so bio R X I V or psych R X I V. Google for those and you can look and see uh, examples of preprint uh, servers. If your study includes survey or interview data from students not from different STEM disciplines and not just biology? Oh, that's a great question. So LSE actually takes a very broad view of biology education. Um, I sometimes say to my students that biology is chemistry, is physics, is math. Um, and so we don't draw a firm line that work only has to involve biology instruction or biology students or biology faculty, but we do ask that you speak to those audiences. So say, for example, you collect data from STEM students. Um, you need to talk about why that's relevant to education interested biologists or biology education researchers. You need to keep that audience in mind, even if you're drawing from a much broader pool of participants or your work has implications beyond biology education. There's a question about how feedback data collected two years ago from elementary students without an IRB is publishable. So that's something that you're going to need to approach your own institutional review board about. We would need some kind of determination. So I have um, seen situations where post hoc, you can get approval from either a school district or from an institution to use de-identified data, um, but that review would need to happen or that determination would need to happen um, at whatever organizations are involved in you know, protecting the rights of those students. There's a question about whether you can send an inquiry about uh, FIT via email. Um, yes, you absolutely can. And my email is linked through the LSE site along with other uh, contact information for editorial board members, but there's my email in the chat. Um, can I review the type of submission suited for an essay? This is, this is tough. 
it's, um, I would recommend looking at the information for authors. It's hard to say what an essay, like all the things an essay can be, but I would say typically essays are reviews or syntheses of bodies of knowledge that have implications for practice. For example, comparing problem-based learning and case study teaching. What are the differences? Why should we care? Why might you use one in one context and one in another context? Something like that. Um, and that's just one example. Feel free to reach out with an abstract or an idea and we can give you feedback on whether that's suitable as an essay. There's another question related to STEM disciplines. Um, could your discussion section comment on both STEM ed broadly and biology education? Absolutely. Um, what we won't publish is something that doesn't speak to biology. Um, there was a manuscript that was uh, submitted recently where biology wasn't even mentioned in the entire manuscript. And so that's very hard to make sense of why biology educators should read about it. And so that would probably not be suitable for publication in LSC. Okay, so what I would like you to do, what I'd like to do now is thank you so much for all your time. And I'd like to encourage you to uh, spend one minute. Writing in the chat one interesting thing you learned during today's section. So take one minute to do that. And this is a sort of assessment for us. Okay, thanks for all the good feedback about today. What I'd like to do now is ask you to also use the chat box to suggest topics that you would like to be featured on online with LSE or other LSE papers you would like to see featured. Our next uh, online with LSE session will feature Dr. Paula Lemons, who will talk about her research recent paper using personas as a tool for learner-centered professional development and that's Friday March 6th at the same time. So please mark your calendars and take a minute to comment on other topics you would like to see featured. And thank you so much for your time. We'll stay on for another few minutes for people to complete their chats um, and wish everyone a good weekend. All right, folks, we're going to sign off now, but thanks for all the suggestions in the chat. I appreciate it.
Have a good weekend.